In this PowerPoint, we're going to look at an alternative way to calculate the enthalpy or heat exchange during a chemical reaction. This method relies upon Hess's law. Hess's law states that the enthalpy change for any process is simply the sum of the enthalpy changes for individual steps in that process. It allows us to use enthalpies measured for other related reactions to calculate the enthalpy of an unknown reaction. It's particularly convenient when it's not possible to easily use calorimetry to determine the enthalpy of a reaction under the conditions we need. And the application of Hess's law in this way is possible because changes in enthalpy are considered state functions. A state function is one which depends only on the difference between the initial and final values of the function, not on the path or steps taken to get from start to finish. An excellent example of a state function is altitude. If you're standing on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, you're at an altitude of 5,895 meters, whether you climbed straight up the side of the mountain, like path X, or zigzagged up, like path Y, or parachuted down from an airplane. The altitude depends only on the difference in elevation between the top of the mountain and sea level. In the same way, changes in enthalpy for a chemical reaction only depend on the differences in enthalpy of the products and the reactants, not on how the reactants combined or the different steps taken to get from reactants to products. So let me show you an example. Say that we wanted to know the enthalpy change for the decomposition of liquid water into hydrogen and oxygen gas. We could achieve this change in either one step or two. In one direct step, we could break apart a molecule of liquid water into hydrogen and oxygen and measure the heat required. In this case, it would require 572 kilojoules of heat. Alternatively, we could do this in two steps. We could first change phase from liquid water to gaseous water. And this phase change would require 88 kilojoules of heat. Then in our second step, we could break apart the gaseous water molecule into our gaseous elements. And the second step would require 484 kilojoules of heat. It turns out that the amount of heat added doesn't change whether we do this in one direct step or in two steps. That's because 484 plus 88 kilojoules equals 572 kilojoules. The exact same amount that we got for our one direct step. So enthalpy is a state function. And what this means is that the change in enthalpy for any reaction depends only on the enthalpy of our starting point, our reactants, and the final enthalpy of our products the difference between that starting and final point. It doesn't matter how many steps we took to get from the starting point to the end point. All that matters is the difference between the two. So we can use Hess's law to calculate enthalpy changes for any reaction. We just have to find several reactions with known enthalpy values that we can add together as individual steps to give us our final reaction. And then we can add the enthalpy values together to give us our final enthalpy. So in doing this, sometimes we need to rearrange our equations to get them to add together correctly. So when we do so, there are several rules that we have to follow. Here's the first one. If a chemical equation is multiplied by some numerical factor, then the enthalpy is multiplied by the same numerical factor. So for example, we know that the enthalpy associated with the vaporization of one mole of water from liquid to gas is 44 kilojoules. This is a thermochemical equation, so remember that that enthalpy value, even though it's given in kilojoules, is scaled to the coefficients of the reactants and products. So it means 44 kilojoules per one mole of liquid water and per one mole of gaseous water. 
since the coefficients on those two substances is 1. Now say that we needed to add together an equation that had two moles of liquid water going to two moles of gaseous water. This is the equivalent of multiplying this entire equation by 2. And that just means that we multiply the coefficients in front of each of the formulas by 2, and we also multiply the enthalpy by 2. So to vaporize 2 moles of liquid water, it requires 88 kilojoules of heat. The second type of manipulation that we might have to do is reverse an equation to get it to add together the way we want it to. So if a chemical equation is reversed, then the sign on the enthalpy is simply reversed or changed. For example, this is the standard equation for the formation of gaseous water from its constituent elements. And the standard enthalpy of formation for that is negative 242 kilojoules per mole of gaseous water. Say that what I really needed, though, was the enthalpy associated with the decomposition of gaseous water into its elements. So this is almost the same equation. It's just reversed. It's flipped so that my product, gaseous water, becomes my reactant. And my reactants of hydrogen and oxygen gas become my products. The coefficients remain the same. The only thing that changes is that we've flipped sides. The products have become the reactants and the reactants have become the products. This is the same as essentially multiplying this equation by negative 1 in order to get it to flip sides. And so we multiply the enthalpy of reaction by negative 1. And we change the sign in this case, from negative 242 kilojoules to positive 242. If you release 242 kilojoules in forming liquid water, then you're going to require 242 kilojoules to break it apart again. Now, I want to add these two reactions together, ultimately, to give us the uh, decomposition of liquid water into uh, its gaseous elements. In order to do this, though, um, I'm going to need to multiply this second equation by 2. So I can apply the first rule here and, and multiply everything in that equation by 2. My coefficients on water become 2, and on hydrogen also 2. 2 times 1 half for my oxygen is actually going to give me 1 O2 molecule. And if I multiply all of my reactants and products by 2, I have to multiply my enthalpy. So I get 484 kilojoules for the decomposition of 2 moles of gaseous water. So the last rule that we need to apply is that if you can uh, express a chemical equation as the sum of a series of steps, then the enthalpy of reaction for that overall equation is the sum of the heats of reaction for each step, or for the enthalpies of each step. So this is Hess's law. And it turns out that uh, these two equations that we've just manipulated the vaporization of liquid to gaseous water and the decomposition of gaseous water add together to be our two steps from the previous slide. And so we can add together these two steps, and then we just add together their enthalpies to get the final enthalpy. So when we add chemical equations together, what we do is simply add together everything that's on the left-hand side of the arrow to become our combined reactants. And we add everything that's on the right-hand side of the arrow together to become our combined products. So our added together reaction becomes two water molecules that are in the liquid form plus two gaseous water molecules produces two gaseous water molecules, plus uh, two molecules of hydrogen gas and one of oxygen gas.
Now, the two gaseous water molecules, uh, they're the same on both sides. And that means that they didn't really change form. So what we can do is actually represent the net reaction and eliminate anything that occurs in the exact same form on each side of the arrow. So we can cancel out our gaseous water molecules. We can rewrite our net reaction as two liquid water molecules break apart into two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen. And we can calculate the enthalpy for this net process as simply the sum of the enthalpy for the steps that we added together to get there. 88 plus 484 gives us 572 kilojoules. So let's look at another example. This time we want to calculate the enthalpy for the synthesis of nitrogen dioxide from elemental nitrogen and elemental oxygen. We don't have that enthalpy directly, but we have two reactions that are related to the one that we're interested in that do have measured enthalpies. So the first is the synthesis of nitrogen monoxide, so NO instead of NO2. And the second is the reaction of nitrogen monoxide with oxygen gas to produce nitrogen dioxide. So our strategy is to figure out how to arrange the thermochemical equations that we have with our known enthalpies so that we can add them together to give us the reaction that we want to know. So my strategy when I look at something like this is to start by looking at each of the reactants and the product that I want in my final equation and figuring out um, how I need to uh, rearrange each individual equation that I'm given with a known enthalpy to give me the reactant molecules in the right place with the right coefficient. So I'll start with the N2. So the equation that has N2 in it is the first one. And it turns out that N2 is on the right side of the arrow. It's uh, on the reactant side, rather, um, which is exactly where I need it to be in my final equation. It also has the correct coefficient on that N2. I need one on my final equation, and I have one for the coefficient in that first thermochemical equation. So right now, this is actually in pretty good shape to give me um, my first reactant in exactly the right number and the right place that I need. Next, I'm going to look at my oxygen. I need two oxygens in my final equation on the reactant side. So that first equation does contain oxygen, but I've only got one of them there. So I'm going to have to add another oxygen to that in some way. And it turns out that my second equation also contains oxygen on the reactant side. So I could probably add these two equations together. But unfortunately, the coefficient on my second equation is 1 half, which means that if I added the two equations together, I would end up with 3 halves oxygen instead of 2, which is what I need. I really need for that second equation to be 1O2 because then I could add one oxygen from the first one and one oxygen from the second one and it would give me 2O2 in my final equation. So I know I can do this though. I can just multiply this entire second equation by 2. 1 half times 2 will give me 1. And if I do that, I'll end up with two nitrogen monoxide plus one oxygen gives me two nitrogen dioxide. And what that will look like is this. And since I've multiplied all of my coefficients by two, I also have to multiply the enthalpy for that reaction by two. So the new enthalpy will end up being negative 114.2 kilojoules. Now I should be able to add together these two reactions. So my N2 plus my 2O2 add together 
and I end up with 2NO2. Now what about this nitrogen monoxide? That's a product in the first equation and a reactant in the second. Well, it turns out that when we add those two equations together, they're going to end up having uh, the same form, one on the reactant side and one on the product side. And so since they're the exact same formula, the exact same phase, and the exact same number, but on opposite sides of the arrow, they actually cancel each other out. So in our final net equation, we don't have to write them. The net equation is simply everything that doesn't cancel out, N2 plus 2O2 plus 2NO2. And our final enthalpy is going to be the sum of the enthalpies for each equation. 180.5 kilojoules plus our negative 114.2 kilojoules, which equals 66.3 kilojoules for this particular process. Let's look at another example. This time we want to calculate the standard enthalpy of formation for methane gas, CH4. To do this, I have three reactions that are all related to the formation of methane gas in some way, shape, or form, and they're measured enthalpies. What I have to do is figure out how I need to rearrange these three known equations to give me the final one that I want. So again, I start with each reactant and each product and just figure out how I need to rearrange the given equations to make sure that they add together to give me a reactant in the right number and the right place. And the same for the products. So we'll start with the first reactant with carbon. And I look and the first equation actually contains solid carbon. It's on the left-hand side of the arrow, the reactant side, which is correct. That's where I need it in my final reaction. And I also have the correct number. I need one in my final reaction, and I have one carbon in that first equation. So there really isn't much that I need to change there, so I'm going to carry it down as is. And then I'm going to move to my second reactant, hydrogen gas. I need two molecules of hydrogen gas. The second equation does contain hydrogen gas, but I only have one molecule of it there. I don't see any other equation there that will add together to give me hydrogen gas, two overall, so I'm going to have to get all the hydrogen from that one uh, step, and that means that I need to multiply this equation by two. I multiply everything um, in the equation, all the coefficients that I'm given, as well as the enthalpy. So that becomes 2H2 plus 1 oxygen, because 2 times 1 half gives me 1, and 2 liquid water molecules. And the enthalpy becomes negative 286 times 2, or negative 572 kilojoules. And last, I need to make sure I can get methane as one of the products. So my last equation does contain methane gas. It's the right number, so it's a one coefficient, which is what I need in the final equation, but it's on the wrong side of the arrow. Uh, it's a reactant instead of a product. So I need to flip this equation around so that I can get methane as a product. So consider this like multiplying the equation by negative one. And what will happen is all of my reactants are going to be written as products in the final equation, and all of my products will be written as reactants. So CO2 plus 2H2O, my products up above are now my reactants, and methane, CH4, and 2O2 are now my products. And I just flip the sign on the final enthalpy from negative 892 kilojoules to positive 892 kilojoules. Now, if I've made it sure that I've got things together in the right side of the arrow and adding together to give me the right number, I should be able to hopefully add these together and uh, get them to equal my final reaction. So I'm going to notice what I can eliminate on each side. 
um, so what will cancel out? So if it's in the same form, same number, and same state on both sides of the arrow, we can actually cancel it out when we put together our net reaction. So the first one I noticed is carbon dioxide. It's present on both the uh, left-hand and the right-hand side of the arrows. In the first equation and the third equation, it's the same number and the same state. I also notice that I have um, a total of two oxygens on the left-hand side when I add the first and second equations, and the third equation contains two oxygens on the right-hand side, so I can cancel those out. And finally, I see that I have two water molecules on the left and the right hand side of the arrow, so I can cancel those out. Now I can add together everything that's left, and it turns out that I just have carbon and hydrogen gas on the left and methane on the right, which is exactly what I need for my final equation. And for the final enthalpy, I just add together all of my enthalpies negative 393 plus negative 572 plus 892 kilojoules gives us negative 73 kilojoules for the standard enthalpy of formation of methane gas. It turns out that Hess's law calculations can be simplified if we use standard enthalpies of formation to calculate the enthalpy change we need. Let's take for example this reaction. We want to calculate the enthalpy change using Hess's law. Now, in order to get a series of individual reactions that we can add together to give us this final reaction, a natural place to start looking would be the reference tables of enthalpies, um, and in particular, the reference tables of enthalpy of formations, because there we're going to be able to find an equation for each of these compounds in their particular phase. Um, and so what we'll find in that table, of course, will be the enthalpy of formation values for one mole of that particular compound. The formation equations won't be given, but we can write those because we know that it's always scaled so that we have one mole of whatever the compound is that we're looking for, in this case, nitric acid. And on, that's on the product side. On the reactant side, we have all the elements that you find in nitric acid, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, in their most stable form at uh, standard temperature and pressure. And the coefficients are scaled just so that uh, we keep a balanced chemical equation with a one coefficient on that product. So we can write the formation equation if we need to. It turns out that we're not going to need to in the end, but let's start with our formation equation so you can see what, how this works. So we could look up the standard enthalpy of formation for each of our reactants and our products. We could write the enthalpy of formation equations for each of our reactants and our products. And it turns out that because of the way enthalpy of formation reactions work, we're always going to be doing the same type of manipulations. First, we're always going to multiply each of our formation equations by the coefficients that we want in our final balanced equation, because the formation equations are always scaled to 1. So if we have a coefficient other than 1, we simply have to multiply by that in order to get that coefficient in our final equation. So for example, in our final equation, we want a coefficient on nitric acid that is 2. Our formation equation has a coefficient of 1. We just multiply that whole equation by 2. We do the same thing for nitrogen dioxide because we need 3. So we multiply that entire equation by its coefficient, 3. We don't have to change anything for water and nitrogen monoxide because their coefficients are already 1. Um, and that's the coefficients that are standard in formation equations. So we're always going to multiply our formation equations by the coefficients on that particular compound in the final equation that we want. The second standard manipulation that we're always going to do is that we're always going to flip the formation equations for our reactants. So we want our three moles of nitrogen dioxide as a reactant here. But in our formation equation, even multiplied by three, it's still on the product side. 
So we need to flip it or multiply it by negative 1. So we're multiplying all of our reactants. We have to do the same thing with water, our other reactant, to flip it so that water becomes a reactant in that equation. And once we've done that, that's all the manipulations we need to do. Multiply by the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation on that particular compound and multiply by negative 1 for each of the reactants. Then you can add everything together and it will always cancel out to give you your final net reaction. And you can add together the enthalpies in the same way after you've done your manipulations. And it turns out that when you do that, you always end up with this same basic standard calculation. The first term is the sum of the enthalpies of formation of your products multiplied by their coefficients. So that uh, Greek letter sigma that looks like a funny shaped E um, stands for sum of a series of different uh, terms. So in this case, the terms are the coefficient of each individual product times its enthalpy. Then you subtract from that the sum of the enthalpy of formations of your reactants multiplied by their coefficients. So let me show you how this actually works. I'm just going to use the uh, balanced chemical equation as a guide here to um, show you how we manipulate everything. And we're only going to deal with the enthalpy of formations in calculating this because we always follow the same manipulations. So we'll start with our products, and I'll start with my nitric acid. I'm going to take 2, which is my coefficient on the nitric acid, and multiply it by the enthalpy of formation of nitric acid. So 2 times negative 207.4 kilojoules. And I'm going to add to that my other product, which is nitrogen monoxide. I have a 1 coefficient, um, so 1 times the enthalpy of formation for nitrogen monoxide, which is 90.2. So that is my first term here, the sum of the enthalpy formation of my products multiplied by each of their individual coefficients. On my reactant side, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to start with my nitrogen dioxide. So its enthalpy of formation is 33.2. I'm going to multiply it by the coefficient from the balanced chemical equation on NO2, so 3 times 33.2. And I'm going to do the same thing for water. Um, I have one of those, and the enthalpy of formation of liquid water is negative 285.8. So that'll be my second term. And then to calculate my final enthalpy of reaction, I'm simply going to subtract this first series from the second series, so the reactants from the products. Now, ultimately, that's the same as uh, multiplying all of my reactant enthalpies by negative 1. So um, another way that you could write this then would be the sum of the enthalpy of formation of my products multiplied by their coefficients minus the sum of the enthalpy of formation of my reactants times their coefficients. And once I uh, do this calculation, I end up with my final enthalpy of my reaction, negative 138.4 kilojoules. And because we're always doing the same manipulations so that we can write one standard equation for using enthalpy of formations, we actually don't even need to write the enthalpy of formation reactions. All we need are the values for enthalpy of formation for our reactants and our products. So say, for example, I wanted to calculate the heat of combustion of one mole of liquid ethanol. So this is the balanced chemical equation for the combustion of liquid ethanol. I have all my reactants and all of my products. I also have all of the enthalpy of formations look, that are looked up in a standard reference table of enthalpy of formations. So that's for each of those different uh, products and reactants. Now you'll notice that um, each of the compounds has a value that's different than zero. So in this case, they're all negative. They're all exothermic formation processes. They could also be positive, but they're different than zero. Oxygen, my element, on the other hand, has an enthalpy formation of zero. 
And it turns out that this is standard. Um, for elements in their most stable elemental form, they always have an enthalpy of formation equal to zero. This is how we scale our enthalpy of formations. So I can use these particular values and my standard equation for calculating enthalpy of reaction from these values to figure out what the heat of combustion of one mole of liquid ethanol is. So all I need to do is take the enthalpy formation for each of my products and multiply by their coefficients and add them together. So 2 for my carbon dioxide times the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide, which is negative 394 kilojoules. I'm going to add to that my second product, 3 for the coefficient on water, times the enthalpy of formation of liquid water, negative 286 kilojoules. That's my product term. I'm going to do the same thing for the reactants. I have one uh, ethanol, so that's one times my enthalpy of formation of ethanol, negative 278, plus three um, oxygen, but of course oxygen is an element, and so it has a zero for the enthalpy, three times zero, which is zero. Now I'm going to subtract my reactant term from my product term, so that's the same as multiplying my reactant term by a negative one. Um, and so I can enter this into my calculator as 2 times negative 394 plus 3 times negative 286 minus, in parentheses, 1 times negative 278 plus 3 times 0, which is 0. And what I'll end up with is negative 1,368 kilojoules for the heat of combustion of one mole of liquid ethanol. So in summary, Hess's law calculations allow us another way to calculate enthalpy for a reaction when calorimetry is not practical. Appropriate standard reactions and their enthalpy values can be manipulated and added together to give us the net process and the enthalpy value that we need. And the use of standard enthalpies of formation simplifies the calculation process.